In this video we're going to talk about endocarditis. And endocarditis is basically a bacterial infection of uh, usually a heart valve. So if we were to draw a very basic diagram of the heart chambers, left atrium, uh, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, the heart valves are, are of course uh, uh, in these areas that I'm drawing. So this one here is your tricuspid. Uh, this one here, of course, is the mitral valve. Uh, this one here is a pulmonic valve. And finally, that one is aortic. And these valves allow um, blood to flow from one chamber to another, and they open and close. Now, the problem is that sometimes these valves can become infected with bacteria. And when that happens, it's endocarditis. Now. Um, there's two factors that you need to have endocarditis. Uh, the first one is some sort of abnormality of the endocardium. Endocardium, of course, is referring to the muscle uh, of the heart. And what type of uh, abnormalities? Well, really what we're talking about is abnormalities involving the heart valves. So that's the first thing you need. And examples of these include calcific heart valves, um, heart valves, HV, um, prosthetic, prosthetic heart valves, those valves that I talked about very briefly uh, earlier, there has to be something wrong with them, maybe a congenital defect or some sort of uh, abnormality. So that's the first thing. The second thing you need is an introduction of some bacteria in the body. And uh, the bacteria can get into a person's body either from an infection, um, urine infection, infection of the gums, uh, gums uh, in your mouth, uh, or some sort of catheter site, and very commonly um, in endocarditis cases, some sort of drug use, IV drug use, um, heroin addicts, for example, that inject uh, heroin into their um, blood vessels with a needle. So those are the two things you need. You need some sort of uh, abnormality of the heart valve and you need some bacteria and the, together the bacteria goes and sits on the heart valve and um, causes endocarditis which is a, a bacterial infection. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms are actually uh, uh, very uh, characteristic. Uh, some of them of course are um, how you say um, common or non-specific like fever and night sweats um, uh, just very being very tired feeling a malaise chills that's another one but there's some that are very specific uh, that uh, they talk about on licensing exams a lot so well, I'm gonna concentrate on those and there's four of them um, and um, I'll try to make a little table here. So these are the the some of the more specific, uh, um, the more like physical exam findings rather than symptoms. So the first one is called Roth spots. So what is a Roth spot? A Roth spot is basically a retinal hemorrhage uh, that you would see on a fundoscopic exam, um, and um, retinal hemorrhage, and this is a um, this can happen in in endocarditis. It's usually the white or pale center, um, and when you do an eye exam, you can notice this, and it's given a special name, the Roth spot. Uh, the next one is called a Osler, Osler's nodes, and what that is is uh, these um, lesions that you can get on your hand um, that are painful. Uh, this is the hand painful lesions and they're usually um, uh, red and they're usually raised and they're pretty characteristic uh, and they're definitely associated with um, endocarditis. The, the other one is called a Janeway lesion and the Janeway lesion is uh, similar in the sense that it's also a, a skin uh, uh, lesion that can be found, for example, on your feet. Um, but the difference is that they're 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 not tender, so they're non-tender, non-tender, and they represent uh, an area of necrosis. So they can appear uh, black, 
because um, uh, it's essentially representing uh, uh, the dead dermis uh, of the skin. And then finally, the the one that um, the last one is called splinter hemorrhage. And splinter hemorrhage is referring to the nails. So if I were to draw, let's say, a finger, and this is the nail. Splinter hemorrhages are these tiny blood clots that run vertically under the nails. Uh, so you you kind of see them like that. When you see these things, it's very characteristic. Okay, so somebody has the symptoms. You've found some pretty characteristic things on the physical exam. What are the diagnostic tests? Well, there's four main ones that you need to do. The first one, the first couple are very basic: CBC and ESR. You know, CBC you're looking for uh, anemia, and um, you're looking for you know these are very non-specific tests, but they're always ordered in in a diagnostic workup of endocarditis. ESR is a erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is a non-specific indicator of inflammation. Essentially, endocarditis uh, is inflammation, and uh, it will be elevated. But the next two are the really the specific ones. Blood cultures, you need to identify the bacteria, and that's done with blood cultures, usually three sets over 24 hours. And finally, you need to identify the organism. Uh, um, you need to visualize the organism, uh, vegetation that's sitting on the heart valve. So if we go back to that diagram, and let's say um, we have a vegetation, let's say, sitting on uh, someone's heart valve, it would be visualized by the echocardiogram, sorry. So the echocardiogram is the diagnostic test um, that you do to visualize the uh, vegetation, which I've drawn. And the blood cultures is what you do to uh, um, isolate and identify the actual organism. So how do you treat it? Well, the mainstay of treatment is IV antibiotics, and there's a long list uh, of uh, antibiotics and antibiotic regimens that you can use, but I'll break it down into basically three categories. Um, the first one is uh, IV drug users. Uh, IV drug users uh, most commonly are infected with an uh, organism called Staph aureus, which is very famous. And when that happens, they're given anti-staph penicillin. Anti-staph penicillin. And uh, those include nafcillin. Um, there's others as well. Uh, nafcillin, oxacillin. Um, I encourage you to read about anti-staph penicillins. Um, nafcillin is probably, probably the most common. Um, oxacillin is another one. Oxacillin. But uh, that's the first one. Second one is if you have MRSA. Uh, MRSA is an organism, um, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And if that is uh, identified uh, as the um, causative bacteria, then you would give uh, vancomycin. And vancomycin is given uh, with uh, gentamicin. So I'm trying to make this uh, uh, not too complicated because. Well, endocarditis regimens are very, very, um, there's many of them, and the tables that they often list have so many. So I'm trying to break it down into uh, just three basic um, regimens. And the, the last one I want to talk about is when you have these mechanical valves. Uh, when people have mechanical valves or previously damaged valves, there's an orga organism called strep viridens. And that is treated with uh, ceftriaxone. Ceftriaxone with gentamicin. So I don't think this is too difficult to remember. Uh, it, it it really kind of narrows things down. And I think uh, for most uh, board questions, you'd be um, OK with this uh, uh, list here. Uh, before I get into a couple clinical vignettes, I just wanted to mention just the last few uh, important points. People with uh, endocarditis or history of endocarditis 
uh, or a risk of endocarditis, uh, need to have something called uh, uh, antimicrobial, uh, if I can spell it, antimicrobial prophylaxis uh, before uh, certain procedures. Now this is a very important point. What that means is that uh, before certain procedures, uh, people with prosthetic heart valves or people with previous endocarditis need to have need to be given antibiotics. So a typical scenario is somebody had endocarditis, let's say, uh, some years ago, and then uh, prior endocarditis, and then they're going for a dental procedure. Now, if you remember earlier in the presentation, I talked about how uh, bacteria can be introduced into your bloodstream from your gums. So if it happens, it could lead to another case of endocarditis. So to prevent that, you give antibiotics prior to the dental procedure. So that's what they mean by an antimicrobial prophylaxis. So now I'd like to uh, talk um, uh, about a few clinical vignettes, and here we go. 27-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of increasing fatigue, malaise, chills, low-grade fevers in the last two weeks. No recent sick contacts, denies any significant past medical history. Patient does mention that he uses heroin frequently, but not since last week. His temperature is 101, blood pressure is 85 over 60, heart rate is 120. Physical exam, patient appears gaunt, malnourished, and dehydrated. Faint systolic murmur is audible. Needle tracks are found on both uh, arms. Petechia are noted across the back, and splinter hemorrhages are found under the nail beds. Lab studies show, I uh, didn't include them, I didn't have enough space, sorry about that. Chest x-ray is normal, EKG, sinus tack, UA shows some protein, red blood cells. Patient is admitted to the hospital, where he becomes progressively more confused and disoriented. Three sets of cultures are drawn, and fluids are initiated. Most appropriate next step is, well, this question has given you a lot of information uh, pointing to endocarditis. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So now you have to figure out what do you do next. Well, I think um, uh, it's a good question and I like it um, uh, because it kind of makes you think, okay, what category is this person in? And it cl clearly tells you he's an IV drug user and there's needle tracks as well. So if you remember, for IV drug users, the most common causative organism uh, for their endocarditis is Staph aureus. And it's treated with anti-Staph penicillins. And anti-staph penicillins include nafcillin and oxacillin. So the answer to this is right here in choice A. Um, you need to initiate uh, antibiotic treatments uh, uh, immediately um, because uh, the patient is becoming uh, progressively more confused. So he's deteriorating. So you don't want to wait uh, until the cultures come back. Uh, next question, a 30-year-old woman with hypertension, migraines, history of IV heroin use, comes to the ED with shortness of breath, cough, and weakness for 10 weeks. Her medications include sumatriptan and atenolol. Temperature is 100, pulse is 100, blood pressure is 130 over 85, respirations are 12. Physical exam reveals a previously undocumented systolic murmur, grade 3 to 4, over the left sternal border and splinter hemorrhages of the fingernails. Lungs are clear, lab tests are pending, electrocardiogram demonstrates sinus tack. Treatment should commence with the tentative diagnosis of. So this question is pretty straightforward. It's just basically asking you, what do you think this patient has? Well, there's a lot of clues. You know, IV drug use, she's got a bit of a fever, splinter hemorrhages. This murmur, um, and the previous question talked about murmurs also. Murmurs are uh, evident on cardiac auscultation um, when a person has endocarditis. It's a physical exam finding. So this question is really is pretty straightforward uh, asking you what is it and it's of course endocarditis. And finally, well this one I ran out of space uh, but I'd like to put in the answer choices. Um, it's always better. So let's see, you got uh, A, B, C, D, and E. So this question, this one, A is um, an echocardiogram showing uh, mitral 
regurgitation, an echo showing uh, vegetations, an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, a positive VQ scan, and finally a single positive blood culture. So those are the answer choices. So let's read the question. 44-year-old man comes to the ED with seven-day history of fever and two-day history of red spots on his eyes. I'm assuming those are the Roth spots. He also reports some lethargy and fatigue. His past medical history is otherwise unremarkable. He does state that when he was a teenager, a physician once told him that he had a heart valve problem that would require him to take antibiotics on dental visits. Okay. Uh, temperature is 99, blood pressure is 140 or 75, pulse is 92, respirations are 16. He has bilateral conjunctival hemorrhages and small indurations present on the dorsal surface of his hands. He has a 1 out of 6 grade systolic ejection murmur and um, heard best at the apex. Most, the finding most likely to confirm the diagnosis is, okay, well, He's got a fever, he's got a history of a heart problem, and he has um, a murmur. And he's also got these characteristic uh, um, physical exam findings. So it all leads to endocarditis. Well, let's go through these. Um, VQ, VQ scan actually refers to a test uh, that you do um, uh, to diagnose pulmonary embolism. So that's probably not it. Uh, single blood culture, well, if he has endocarditis, it probably, uh, the, all the blood cultures will probably be positive, uh, so probably not E. Uh, um, elevated ESR will, will definitely be uh, part of the diagnostic workup, but it's not the most likely, it's not the really, the, the test that you do to confirm it. So now you're left with A and B. Well, if you do an echocardiogram and it shows mitral regurge, that doesn't confirm uh, endocarditis. You have to actually do an echocardiogram and see vegetations or some sort of mass uh, on the valve, and that will confirm that this patient indeed has a bacteria that has infected the heart valve. So the answer is B, which is an echocardiogram showing vegetations or a valvular mass.